Right. All right. The Monerotopia guest segment is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. With this like, gentleman who's, I don't know, this might be your like third espresso. Yeah, right. My third espresso. You can't have enough caffeine, man. I mean, you got to keep coming back until you get the jitters and then find some way to chill out. But uh, hey, I'm John Kittleson. I'm running for U.S. House of Representatives. Yeah, your face uh, yeah. is blocked. Yeah. Come over oh, here. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> you know, I see it was behind <laughs> there. Yeah, hey, John Kittleson, running for U.S. House of Representatives, District 6 in Colorado. Uh, super stoked to be here at the conference. We're getting tons of traction. I mean, we've been on Fox all day. Uh, my boss was texting me, telling me about it. Got a selfie with Vivek, and hopefully... Oh, you met Vivek? Yeah, I met Vivek. Got a Shit. You know, picture, shaking his hand and stuff. Uh, I'm really hoping to meet Ron Paul. That's top top tier on my list. Uh, my dad's a huge Trump supporter, so he wants me to get a selfie with Trump. Uh, so I'll, I'll, for him, I'll try and get the selfie just to make him jelly, give him the story. Um, but yeah, you, you got to teach me your ways. How do you even get up there? Wow. Oh, okay. So you just got to like push your way or like act like you belong, right? I mean, so, you know, a lot of hackers, uh, social engineering, as long as you pretend like you belong, like just, you know, like look at the people who do belong, look at their facial expression, look at their mannerisms and just mimic that and just like, like yeah, take in that energy and like, hey, I belong here. Nobody questions it as long as you have the confidence. Okay. Uh, you just do that. You know, you get into, uh, I've gotten a selfie with every single person I've wanted to so far. Yeah. 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 So this is no different. Awesome conference. I'm having a ball just meeting people. I mean, the people here, you got uh, whatever you're into, man, there's somebody who will talk your ear off. And you know, I mean, like, what, what is your platform? You said you're running. Like, what, yeah, what, what is your platform? Absolutely. Uh, charter schools. I, I We need uh, to get away from public education. I think the government is indoctrinating our kids with their message. Uh, this is watering down, making them obedient, right? I think if there's one thing we could do to really make the country a better place, I'm talking about like minorities, all sorts of demographics, right? Uh, I think everybody would benefit from at least having um, some sort of system where, hey, you get a ticket and wherever you want to go to school, you turn in that ticket and they get the funding for your child, right? So the, the best school is going to get the most funding, right? Uh, best school so they can compete, right? So if it's a trash school, uh, nobody's going to want to go there, right? They're going to take their kids' tickets somewhere else, and that school's going to be defunded. They're going to say they're closing schools, and it's like, well, it was a crappy school. It it should go away, right? You know, leave room, fund the schools that are doing good work and, like, attracting parents and educating kids. So I think that's what it's about. That's a big issue. Yeah. I like that. I like yeah, absolutely. that. Absolutely. Uh, this, this is Monero, Monerotopia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, what What is... What is your take, understanding of, of Monero? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a great privacy coin, right? I think it is a privacy coin uh, of the dark web for a reason. I mean, a lot of sites are getting shut down. Uh, a lot of bad OPSEC. Uh, it was, uh, who was the one that just got shut down? Uh, he was, he, he, uh, he rug pulled, right? And he was extorting his users. Um, it was a dark website. Um, oh, so incognito? incognito. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the dude, bad obsec, right? His Monero fucking wallet, he was like putting in public, like, hey, this is like my wallet. And the, that wallet was linked to uh, transactions that he was doing. So he linked his name to his wallet and then that wallet to all these shady transactions. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not perfect. You still have to practice good obsec, of course. But I mean, for the most part, I mean, like, yeah, good luck. Oh. He, he he could have done it the right way with Monero and Absolutely. used it the right way, but he, uh, which that boggles my. That's a whole yeah. lot, like yeah. these guys that go through all these efforts to do these scams yeah. and high risk activity, yeah. and it's like yeah. Mon using Monero the correct way is the easy part. Yep, 100%. and they fucked that up. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Shout out to uh, Mental Outlaw. He's also. Uh, they always boast in Monero and stuff. He yeah, I love that guy. We've yeah. never been able to make contact with oh, him. No. I don't know why. Reach out to us, Mental yeah, Outlaw. Let mental us. Outlaw. Yeah. yeah. Hey, say what's up, buddy. Yeah, what's going on? But uh, yeah, so he has a lot of good stuff, uh, news for these sites. Um, so that's a good dude to follow, good resource. Yeah, good, good merch. Monero, digital cash. What do you think about that in terms of uh, how libertarians sh should be should be talking about it? That issue, right? Because it is an issue. Yes. Um, 
we're kind of talking about some of those things right now, right? It's yeah. the most used coin on the dark markets. Yeah. How do you think libertarians should be talking about that that issue? Well, I definitely think it should be more front and center, but I think it's an educational issue, right? We're not impervious to just group think. Uh, and I think Bitcoin, there's a lot of these different coins that have a lot of momentum and people are just, uh, you know, look at fashions, right? Uh, so how are you feel about Kim Kardashian? She started dating Kanye West and Kanye West, one of the very first things he did was like, look at her wardrobe. And it was like, this is all trash. This is like, you know, from all these great designers, but this is like, you know, what's in fashion right now, you need to be fashion forward. Like you need to be adopting stuff and then people see you wearing it and they start wearing it, right? So do, don't wear other people's stuff, you know, make your own thing and, you know, be fashion forward, be setting the trend, right? So Monero, like we're like the fashion forward ones. Like the whole point of having this crypto is like, this is the freedom, right? That's like the main draw to crypto is the freedom behind it, right? So we're the fashion forward ones. And, you know, it takes a little bit of time. Most people are sheep. Um, so, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, these other coins are going to persist for a while. But as long as we stay true and we, we it, you know, keep performing through and through like, hey, you know, we have those privacy benefits. Hey, you know, we're still around. No issues. Government can't just confiscate your money. Um, I think over time, you know, we're going to come out on top. Do you think Monero becomes the the crypto of the Libertarian Party at some point? Oh, I'd like to see it. Yeah, no, I, I definitely believe in Monero above all other tokens. I mean, just from the privacy aspect. I mean, that's like I said, like that's the point of having like digital currency is the freedom, right? You're getting away from the state. I mean, now they're talking about a central bank currency and all this crazy stuff. I mean, look at China. You have to use your phone to do anything, any kind of transaction. You have to use the was Wemo or whatever it's called. Venmo, yeah. Yeah, their version of Venmo. Uh, you know, at the at the it's some crappy road stand to buy oranges. You know, you still have to use this. Cash is like non existent, right? So it's like I that's there's like nothing more terrifying because uh, there's that saying, show me who controls the money and I'll show you who controls uh you know, controls the society. Like whoever has control of the money, that's it. Like, you know, you're everybody's beholden to them. I know. This is why I'm here like a maniac <laughs> running around every libertarian. They're like yeah, no, no, I get you. I get you. But, but like that, I think it's an issue worth being obsessive about. And I think every libertarian should be cognizant of it, right? 100%. 100% agree. And I appreciate that you have the espresso machine. Oh, let, me, let me make that. Cool. Let me make that as we go, as we wrap up here. Because I know you want to get back to the conference. Hold for on. Sure. Yeah, we're doing the uh, presidential nomination right now. Uh, I'm hoping for Recton Wall, but, you know, we'll see. We just had the debate anyway. I'm not sure what's next on the agenda, if I'm being honest. Uh, but it's been an amazing conference so far. Uh, like I said, we've had tons of top tier speakers coming through. Uh, Thomas Massey, the only real human in Congress, uh, as far as I'm concerned, doing real, real honest things. That dude's like above reproach. Uh, love him to death. Uh, He's speaking today? Uh, no, but he was around yesterday. He was doing a lot of stuff yesterday. Uh, he's not around today, but um, I know Trump's probably going to be the biggest name coming through today. Thank you very much. Trump's going to be the biggest name coming through today. Um, can you help me get a question to, to Trump? Can we can we, can we we want to get his take on on untraceable digital cash? Okay. All right. Would, would he be would would he would he be be opposed to any ban of such technology? Okay, I'll I, I'll think about the question. Yeah, and I'll just be like, if I if I see him, if I shake his hand. Because I'm a Marine Corps veteran, and I know he likes taking pictures. So, like I'm telling you, social engineering, right? Know your audience. Like uh, he always stops taking pictures, of, like cops and military and stuff. So I'm gonna throw that out there. So yeah, I mean, it's hard to come out with this. You got to come up with a sound bite that he'd understand. Like yes. yeah, yeah. I have to if you say question. just digital cash, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah, what? yeah. Yeah. Where 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 do you stand on untraceable digital I mean, cash? Uh, you, gotta, you have to be like. Uh, with regard to like the freedom of digital currencies, you know, I know it's so hard to get it like a soundbite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially for Trump. Yeah. So like, I mean, you got like Trump. Like... Trump. They're eliminating cash. Yeah. What do you think about digital cash? Yeah, yeah. Do we need that? Yeah, something like that. Like <laughs> hey, cash is going away. It's just digital. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. 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 So I'll, I'll I'll think about that if I see him. Yeah. Yeah. I'll Vivek. I was hoping to get that to Vivek, but I, I wasn't. I I wasn't around for the. Uh, it was after the debate yeah. or after he. He gave his talk. Yeah, yeah, it was right after he gave his talk. Uh, 
yeah, kind of like push my way up to the front and stuff. And like his manager, I almost didn't get it. His manager was giving him a sign, like wrap it up. And I like pointed at him. I'm like, quick picture. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, all right. And I was like, yes. So I got a selfie with him. So that was cool. Did you watch Kennedy's talk did, yesterday? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was up at the front. Uh, the whole time I've been sitting on the press tables. I don't check credentials. So I've just been like going and sitting at the press tables, making friends with all the press people. Um, so I've had front row seats to all the talks. <laughs> yeah, just like yeah, that's yeah. the way to do it. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I said, man, it's just like you just roll up, act like you belong, and nobody questions it. Actually, I mean, look look at us over here. If you, if you notice, we're the only one with a, a circular. Oh, man, that's so funny, dude. You're doing it. Right, we set up man. our we set up our own stand right in front of the. We, we know the you social. Yeah, Dan, you did it. I love it. I love it. You got it's the full coffee, espresso machine yeah. running. You're bribing people with awesome espresso, man. You did it, man. Hell yeah. I appreciate it. I really do. I really do. It's the best way to talk, get access to everybody at the conference because at some one point or another, they're going to want espresso. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. No, I mean, I've come back. This is like my third espresso, like you're saying, man. I'm like, you're my favorite booth by far. And there's so many booths. I probably agree with what they're saying, but I haven't even stopped to talk to their people. So you're doing it right. You got a good angle, man. Awesome, man. Well, um, let me know if there's anybody else you think we should get on the show today. Sure. If you have any thoughts on that, sure, uh, sure. and send them our way. We'll be going for like yeah, the yeah. next hour or so. All right. All right. Yeah. If I see somebody I know is interesting, I'll send them your way. I promise. Very cool, man. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Again, John, District 6 in Colorado. Uh, if you live like in Aurora, Arapahoe County, I'll probably be on your ballot. I appreciate your vote. What are the odds of winning? I, I, I... Uh, pretty much nothing. So I'm running against uh, Jason Crow. Who's that absolute pussy who's cowering in fear in J6? You know, you, there's a famous picture of a dude like cowering in fear. He was an army ranger. And this dude, yeah, I mean, like, don't even get me started, dude. It's gonna, like, it's so pathetic. You know, here you are in military, you're a veteran, special forces nonetheless. Okay, and, and more than that, like, the dude behind him is just like casually on his cell phone. Like, everybody else is just like, eh, whatever. And he's like, cowering next to the pier uh, the wall thing whatever just like cowering in fear i mean it's a pathetic picture so i'm really psyched to be running against him uh i think i'm in an area where a lot of people are just going to vote down ticket so we'll see how i how i fare in the end but i'm gonna have a lot of fun uh, yeah it's, it's, it's really tough for the liberty i mean this in any district it's oh, like sure. you know one one percent of the sure. of the populace right yep. i ran in 2020 for, for U.S. Congress, but I ran it on the Republican ticket. Okay, fair enough. So, uh, worked out very well. Didn't win, but we got like 44% of the vote. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, hey, 44, that's pretty good. And then the seat actually did, because it's primarily Democratic district, been Democratic for, for decades. Yep. Um, and then after that election, two years later, the seat flipped Republican. Okay. So you just, you just that timing wasn't the best, but you had to wait for voters to get a little bit more tired of the people that were in. That's what they do. It's like, oh, this side isn't working. Let's put the other side in. That'll fix it. And it never does. And I don't know what your local area is like, but I'm sure there's some, you know, political organizations that kind of kind of run the political scene, I imagine. Right. No, Locally? We run the political scene. No, no I'm saying you're, you're running against the, the Democrats yeah, yeah, and the yeah. Republicans. Those are, are machines yeah. that you're up against. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We're up against machines, especially the uh, Democrats. The Republicans are really shattered, kind of broken uh, in this regional area of Colorado. Uh, just because it's so blue, uh, they're having a lot of trouble finding good candidates themselves, which is good for me. You know, like, you know, run like the crappiest guy you can find. I, I mean, that just makes me look better. Uh, and crypto is probably something that never even comes up, like something you're not really even talking about, I imagine. Oh, well, not particularly on my campaign because I want to you know, be more focused on education. I think that's the something I really, truly believe in. And I think everybody else is fed up. And it's like, that's a great message. You know, if I start doing crypto, I'm 100 percent pro crypto. Like, right. Right. But I'm saying, yeah, it's not something you're bringing up on the, on the campaign trail. Not, doubt, right. Yeah, yeah. Not something no. I'm bringing up on the campaign trail. I'll probably now that we're talking about like a digital worldwide digital bank currency, you know, like talk about that's like, a good one to bring up. Yeah. yeah, people can relate. And the and the elimination of cash. Yes, and the elimination of cash. So those those topics, yes. And you know, throw in crypto as like an alternative, like, hey, we already have our own solution. We don't need like government controlled, you know, whatever. Yeah. Very cool, man. All right, awesome. All right, I cheers. You. Thank you. I'll take care. All right, we're back live at the Libertarian National Convention, and I'm here with Lisa. Lisa Ekman. Um, Lisa Ekman. Lisa, 
if you can uh, briefly introduce yourself. I know that there's there's many things we, we could talk about, but uh, let's start with a brief introduction. So briefly, um, I was a Democratic advocate and lobbyist, a lawyer here in Washington, D.C. for 20 years. Um, and during the COVID pandemic, uh, the attacks on our liberty, especially our First Amendment rights, um, woke me up to the fact that the Democrats were leading us down a slippery slope of tyranny. And I'm a classical liberal. And so when you start censoring people's speech, saying we're the right to assemble, their right to protest, to freely associate, and freely practice their religion, not practice a religion, then lost me. And, you know, the people who censor are never on the right side of history. So I woke up and I decided to, once I put my brain back together, because it's a, it, it, it is very humbling. And uh, when you realize you're wrong about everything, um, and being able to admit that is hard, being able to admit that publicly, especially when you have been very vocal about what you believe um, is. So, so you are you are an active Democrat. You are. A... Yes, I was an active Democrat. I was the president of the law Democrats at my law school. I um, was I worked for Ted Kennedy at one point. So it kind of gives you how brainwashed and how indoctrinated into what I would call the progressive cult I was. So waking up, sort of my entire reality shattered. And once I put myself back together, I said, I feel like our country is in real danger. Our constitutional republic, the very basic foundation of what makes America unique and special is at risk. And I can't be silent. So I decided to write a book. And that book is called Deep Programming Democrats. Deep, deep Programming Democrats. And, um, and uh, I decided it, decided to do everything I could to wake other Democrats up and help people who want to help people uh, or wake up. And so I decided to come here because although I'm not quite ready to join another party, the Libertarian Party most matches my values. And I have been networking and trying to help Libertarian candidates understand how they might reach Democrats or former Democrats who are independents um, to help fight for liberty and freedom. Which is great. I mean, I see, you know, at the end of the day, everybody here is here for, for liberty, right? So no matter what form it gets to people is, is a good thing, right? So if people want to stay in the registered Democrats or stay registered Republicans, but opening up their eye, eye, eyes to some of the hypocrisy of what they may believe in their own camps, that uh, they need to, they need to come out of that trance, like you said. What ha I mean, how are you proposing to deprogram a Democrat? So I, that's a hard question because it really is an individualized process. Nobody, as a Democrat, arrives to their programming and their indoctrination in the same way, so they're not going to be able to leave it. But the first thing that you have to do, one of the things that indoctrination does, especially through our school system, is shut down the capacity to ask questions, to question things. So, um, and the other thing that it does is create what I would call a monopoly on knowledge. So if you are a Democrat, if someone hasn't been educated and credentialed, they're not going to take your word for it. They idolize the expert. And so- um, That is so, so true. I uh, I mean, that that's, that's part of, how the whole system works, right? Right, and I would say that um, establishment Republicans sort of idolize the experts, they're just different experts too. So this could, Fair. could work on some Republicans as well, but my experience is with Democrats, so that's what I'll mostly speak to. And the, the idea is to ask them questions because most leftists live with a great deal of cognitive dissonance. They hold ideas that can't go together, but their brain is sometimes somehow able to do that. So when you ask them questions designed to increase the level of cognitive dissonance until the point where their brain can no longer hold those two ideas, and you know, th then their brain will break um, and then they can start thinking again. And that's really what the goal is because most Democrats don't question what the party tells them they take the talking points and they repeat them. So when you can get them to start asking questions and thinking again, that's the first step. When you had your kind of wake up, you said it was in 2020, right? When you, when you woke up, um, when you were, I'm sure you were approaching your, your peers at that time, fellow 
Democrats, people, friends, whatever, um, and talk to them about these issues, what kind of responses were you, were you getting? So in 2020, um, my situation was actually kind of unique. Um, uh, when COVID hit and they started to lock DC down, I got out of DC because if I didn't know how it was going to go, and I'm an avid reader and I watch a lot of movies, and generally things don't go well once things start getting locked down. So I got out of DC and I went to an RV with my then boyfriend, and we went to West Virginia near his family. So I deprogrammed myself outside of the bubble. And I think that helped a lot. Uh, if you think back to the, like the 1970s when there was a lot of deprogrammers for cults, first thing they do is they take the person out into the nowhere. And so they quit getting all the messages. You, you opted out is what we like to call it in Monero land. Yes, I, I totally opted out. Um, and I bought the COVID narrative hook, line, and sinker at the beginning. My boyfriend didn't. We were fighting. He kept asking me questions. He kept pushing me to research for myself. And I started at that point to see the censorship that was happening on the left. And they were saying, well, don't research because those aren't, you know, those aren't the facts. That's not true. And that dissonance in my brain, you know, um, started making me think I need to research. And then he asked me the question that finally sort of broke the dissonance in my head. Um, and, you know, I had long been filtering water and drinking clean water. And he asked me this question. He said, if they'll poison our water, what won't they do? And my brain could not answer that question because as, as you know, water is essential for life. We're made up of 70% water. So if they're poisoning the most essential thing for us, what won't they do? And the big break, for, the big block for me was I just couldn't believe the government would be doing what they were doing during COVID on purpose to hurt us. And once that break left, then I went down all the rabbit holes. Right. Once you see if they're if they're willing to do that, what else are they doing that we're not even that cognizant of? Because that one was right in our face. Oh, right in our face. And the other thing was that I had done a lot of research and had changed the way I was eating and and you know filtering my water because I helped my mom to at least for a while beat cancer through nutrition and supplementation and detoxification. So I had learned a lot about what actually makes us sick and what keeps us healthy. And everything they were recommending was really against what keeps us healthy. So isolation, fear, all of those things are very damaging to your immune system. Keeping us inside where you can't get... Separating us from our families, our religion, our, our, our you know, being able to go practice your religion at uh, your church exactly all of those things and so in combination with the fact so our, our government doing all of that and our government is um uh poisoning our water poisoning our food uh led me to then be able to question everything else our government has done and is doing and once that happens it all of the lies become really obvious and then I was also watching them censor in real time, you know, and I was watching them actually what I would call our ministry of truth because I reread George Orwell's 1984 during the pandemic. And it was scary because of how clear it was what they were doing. But I watched them um, along with what I call the Mockingbird Media because it's very we don't have a free and, a free and independent legacy media in this country. You know, it's very much propaganda, was watching them rewrite headlines to rewrite history in real time. And technology is amazing for that because if without the internet, I wouldn't have been able to know they were doing that. But that also helped me go, okay, I'm not going crazy. I'm actually awake and in control of my own mind for the first time in a very long time. So some of the ideas you keep mentioning is uh, this ability for, for governments to, to censor, right? Uh, which I think is a good segue to a technology like Monero, which, which intends on being censorship resistant, surveillance proof, digital cash, allowing anyone anywhere in the world to transact with anyone anywhere else that's also, uh, you know, being able to see the transaction, um, only spending you know a fraction of a cent, completely private digital cash, a utility that no government controls or can manipulate or co-op 
corporation can. What are your thoughts on that concept? And, uh, you know, and is this a tool that society needs to avoid such dystopia that we're talking about here? Um, 100%, I think it is. And, you know, I, I, I will first say that physical cash needs to stay around. Um, but it's not. Way that's happening. Ship has sailed. Having, been, having said that, um, 100% that is needed. Um, one of the most important amendments that has just, from our Bill of Rights, that has been completely gutted and decimated is the Fourth Amendment. Every transaction I have with you, every conversation I have with you should be, um, the government shouldn't be able to see it or track it, uh, but they can and they do. And especially the younger people are, the less they even know what the Fourth Amendment is and the less they uh, are aware that everything they're doing is being tracked and followed. Um, I talk about this in my book, but most people don't realize that all of pretty much all the internet technology was created with money given by our, our intelligence agency, uh, Defense and Magic Research Administration, the NSA, and all of the internet companies have ties to those intelligence agencies. And so when you say something or do something online, it's almost 100% trackable and the government um, almost never needs a warrant to look at what those co the data that those companies have and when you agree to those terms of service to use that website or to use that app you're agreeing to that and so I, I will admit that I don't have any invested in crypto for the very reason that you mentioned when it runs you know a ransomware um, Team and they pay in Bitcoin and the FBI can immediately get that Bitcoin back, which we saw happen. Uh, we have seen happen on numerous occasions now. It's clear that those transactions are in fact being tracked. And so that's it. That, that was some, that was the moment that opened your eyes to that, right? When you saw that large ransomware hack with uh, the pipeline, the colonial pipeline. And yeah, they, they caught the guys because of the traceability of Bitcoin. Absolutely. And so um, you know, and I, I will admit that that kind of, you know, turned me off to crypto um, because, um, you know, I am very aware of how the social credit uh, score system in China works. And so when you go all digital and the government can track it, they then also have the ability to shut it down. And so in China, if you are if you are saying things against the regime, if you are doing things that the regime doesn't like, your social credit score goes down. And if it gets to a red level, you can't get money, you can't buy groceries, you can't go anywhere. And if we go to a, <clears throat> excuse me, central bank digital currency here without an option that is not traceable and not trackable, I am very worried about the, our own future and our First Amendment rights under uh, and other rights for um, if we go to that system without an ability to have the ability to transact with other individuals without the government knowing. Any thoughts, insights on how far things may go in terms of the government's trying to prevent technology like Monero from being adopted? Well, I think it's sort of a good news, bad news situation. They seem to be really behind, you know, the eight ball, so to speak, on getting any kind of, of regulation around digital currency and other things, which is a good in some ways, but um, I think that maybe that's because they haven't seen a large threat. And if, if uh, it gets to the government sites that Monero is a threat, uh, I could see them moving aggressively to try to limit the ability to use it. Um, and I will admit that I am not, you know, very tech savvy or crypto savvy. So I don't understand how um, maybe it, it works uh, that so that we that it is. Cool, but I would uh, I would guess that they would be their brightest minds at the NSA on figuring out how to track it. And so uh, do you think they would ever try to outright ban it? Or that would be too much of uh, an infringement on, on the Bill of Rights? It's really hard for me to say. I wouldn't have thought they would have done a lot of things that they already have. And I think that um, 
to, to try to justify banning code, open soft software that people are running on their computers would be a, a real stretch. I think it would be a real stretch, but I also thought it would be a real stretch that I would ever hear my government use the word disinformation, misinformation, or malinformation when talking about citizen speech that was um, criticizing our government. So I, what I think it has happened is, you know, when Donald Trump got elected, the establishment viewed that as a big threat to their power. And so um, power over principle. And I don't know that they respect the Bill of Rights. And I, I'm not just speaking about Democrats here. I'm speaking about Republicans as well. Because when, you know, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely threats to power, then make the ends seem to justify the means. And so while I agree that finding the constitutional justification to ban untraceable crypto would be very challenging. That doesn't that that doesn't mean they won't try it. Um, mask mandates were completely unconstitutional. They did it anyway and let the Supreme Court strike it down. So the other thing they might do is ban it, knowing that they, that the ban will be overturned. But in the meantime, they have it suppressed, and that I think is a tactic that especially the Biden administration, but I wouldn't put it past. They've delisted it from all major exchanges. Kraken still has it in the U.S., but yeah, they've used other methods to basically clamp down and make it difficult for people to obtain Monero. Uh, but in Monero, I mean, the, the community kind of, anytime an action like this is taken, there's almost kind of been celebration, right? Um, banning Monero for centralized exchanges. Well, what does that do? That forces people to obtain Monero in other ways, in actual ways where they're not easily KYC'd. Anybody that's purchasing crypto on exchanges gets KYC. So now you're forcing, you're kind of pushing Monero into the shadows, but that's also forcing it to be able to grow on its own and survive in the shadows, almost making it stronger is the, is the standpoint for a lot of people in Monero. And, and I, I can really understand that. Um, and I guess what I think, I think maybe right now, maybe the Monero is ahead of where the intelligence agencies are um, on trying to keep control of of crypto of digital currency. Um, I would bet that as if, if as they continue to try to move to a central bank digital currency, they will um, do their best to figure out how they can ban it and and it and. Um, but I will also, you know, give credit to the designers and say maybe, you know, they'll stay one step ahead. And but I would expect to see as the move towards central bank digital currency becomes stronger, that the, the efforts to block any development or use of any kind of current digital currency outside of that central bank digital currency will accelerate. And the, the you know, if, if we're going to a central bank digital currency, in a move to go towards a social credit system uh, like China, uh, there will be no respect for the Bill of Rights. Once we reach that point, that's gone. So that won't be something that I don't. I think will hamper those same individuals from trying to block any civil digital. Get your guns now. Get your Monero now before it's more difficult to do so because <laughs> you're going to need it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elisa. Here's the book. Guys, check it out. I think it's very cool, Deprogramming Democrats. The fact that you went through this process and you've uh, thought deeply about how to uh, convince people in your, your prior par party how to leave the, leave the dark side and, and come to the light of liberty. Uh, it's, it's really important because you're, you're at the forefront of where, where the party or this, these ideas need to start to grow because... Everybody here in this room, they're already they're already on board, right? We're, we're we're preaching to the choir here. The only way we make progress is getting these ideas and memes out to the broader community, to the masses beyond the whatever five percent of the population that already understands why liberty is so important. Well, I think two things I'll say just to end it, and that is that I believe our constitutional republic is in grave danger, and we are at the precipice of losing what our forefathers fought so hard to establish this unique constitutional republic in the world and 
everybody who can speak up needs to because we the people have immense power but we've given it away by being complacent and comfortable and we need to be willing to step out of that comfort zone speak up and and take our power back and just use monero and opt out there you go <laughs> all right thank you so much greatly appreciate it that was awesome all right we got we got more people that want to jump up over here which is great this is this is the perfect segue actually we're talking about potentially banning monero and we have we have the premier expert on the topic himself he's i'll just go back and forth i guess He's he's running a campaign on uh, on why we must ban Monero. Is that correct, sir? Uh, that is. I run the website banmonero.com, and uh, Monero is money for terrorists. So, you know, when you use Bitcoin or or just your bank account, the government can see what you're doing, and that's good. It makes us all safe, safe and warm and happy inside, because no one's doing any crimes. But with Monero, they can't do that. So that's why we need to call the government and ban Monero. And if enough of us do that, what might happen? You know, well, well when we um, say, for example, you uh, uh, there's a gun crime and you call the government, you say, you know what? I don't like this gun stuff. Let's ban guns. All the crime goes away, right? Or uh, people do drugs, people overdose on fentanyl. So you call the government and you say, well, let's ban fentanyl. And the problem goes away, right? The government keeps us safe. So we should ban Monero. It's worked in the past. Why not do it now? Uh, no, but seriously, um, it's obviously a joke. But uh, I'm a big Monero fan. I'm probably the biggest fan at the whole convention. Uh, I'm one of the delegates for the Nevada, uh, state of Nevada. Uh, currently the Silver State, but maybe we can make it the Monero State. That would be amazing. It would be great. Um, I'm also, you know, I'm around a lot in the, in the Monero community. Um, I, I have a podcast where we teach about... Uh, Taking control of your own sovereign, uh, your your data, your your own farmland. Uh, we do the whole thing. Um, what podcast is that? Uh, it's called The Canary in the Cage. So uh, we, we got like two viewers right now, but hopefully we'll pick up maybe one more from you guys. Um, and uh, Monero is one of our big things. We give away Monero on every episode. So even if, if you don't like us. You're going to pick up viewers now. Here you go. <laughs> if you don't care about our ranting or any of the, not, I mean, we talk a lot of nonsense. Uh, come for the free Monero. Fantastic, and you throw in a, you throw Monero meetups as well, or it, you were saying in um, Vegas. I I am not the organizer. Um, you actually might know the guy Mike Groove from from Las Vegas. Yeah, um, the Shroom guy. Yes, uh, he's a friend of mine. Um, we're we're trying to set up a a whole thing where we get a lot of local merchants coming on board. Uh, we're going to give them POS systems. Uh, we're going to have them do their own accounting. It's all going to be self contained, self sovereign, self custodial. Uh, you know they're going to run a node. Uh, we're going to set it all up for them, and we're going to hope to get the whole city uh, on a circular economy with Monero. Holy shit, man! Uh, as you make progress with that, please jump on this show anytime. You know we we have our like our guests that we make it super easy. Jump on anytime. Would love to follow that project. And uh, if you're really serious about it, and you're making pro, you might want to do a Kuno or something. I mean, that's something the community would certainly get behind. You think you can get traction there? Uh, and start getting people to adopt it in their in their stores. Yeah, we already have a couple stores that are doing uh, Litecoin and, and Bitcoin Cash. Uh, Monero's a little harder because we have to do the self custody thing. Uh, but we're gonna actually um, donate, uh, you know, machines that are powerful enough to run Node, and then run the and then write the POS for them or find something that's usable. We have we have the Monero Nodos that we're we're okay. producing. Maybe that. I don't know if I mean those are yeah um, we're, we're selling them for a decent price. I don't know if that fits the bill or you're looking for something more. Uh, yeah, let's, just a little... uh, let's talk about that because we we were looking at a I, I won't mention the competitor, but uh, we were looking at open source solutions to do this, and uh, yeah, we will check yours out as well. That's fantastic, man! I'm I'm loving this. Who who else is uh, working with you on this? Um, like I said, Mike Groove. Um, there's a guy named Steve. He's all a, a big help. Um, there's a guy on Twitter I recruited. He's not from Vegas, but he's interested in getting this out to other cities. Uh, he, he goes by David Black on Twitter. Um, so right now, like, are you guys organizing anywhere? You're in a, a, like a group somewhere on Matrix or anything? Uh, we do have a signal chat. Um, if you want to contact me directly, uh, go to the canaryinthecage.com, our podcast website. 
Uh, you can get all my contact info from there, and then I can hook you up. Um, I'm also on Twitter. Uh, I'm a big troll, so you might not see my post show up. They'll be hidden. Um, I've been seeing the band Monero. Every time I see it, I click on it. You know, that's not me. I don't know who. Oh, that's not? I thought that was you. No, but you're the Bam and Arrow website. Yes, I run the website, but I don't know who is spamming my Twitter, my, my link on Twitter. I don't know who that is. So some guy just found it, and he's like, oh, Bam and Arrow. It's probably somebody who actually does want a Bam and Arrow. He's like, look at this. Look what I found. It might be, but hey, uh, good, any publicity is good publicity for Monero, especially when you um, get people thinking about, you know, well, what do you mean, Bam? Uh, there's the whole Streisand effect where where – People want to do what you won't let them do. So if people think there's a campaign to ban Monero, people might want to get into Monero and realize, oh, it can't be banned. You're just running math on your computer. You can't ban that. So, so if you call enough Congress people, uh, <laughs> we could get that Streisand effect in full effect oh, oh, in no yeah. time. If you have, I mean, there's a lot of people in the so-called privacy space that will not say the word Monero. And it, it pisses me off to no end. Too. But uh, if you get a famous person to just say the word, boom, man, like Google spikes goes up. Uh, people will download the app, uh, kick wallet or whatever wallet you prefer. I would just wanted to get RFK Jr. to say that, say the, say the word or Vivek. Yeah. That's, that was kind of part of my mission here, but it's been uh, it's hard. It's hard. proven to be a little difficult. It's hard. It's definitely hard. Um, I, that's why I kind of go the troll route, like to get them uh, not so offended that they block me, but offended enough to respond and uh you know just get the conversation going are you familiar with xmr bazaar do you know that we're launching that i you you did tell me that earlier but uh okay yeah just bring it up because uh some of these ideas are talking about like any business that you get added you could also we, we have a business listing right. so it could show the the map where they are you know vegas oh, nice. whatever uh people will know to, to find them yeah uh, that sounds great like well yeah let's uh let's discuss and get it going Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. Wait, do we, Sunita, do we have uh, the gold backs guy? Oh, no. Go get him. Oh, my God. All right. Get, get, get uh, Ben, though. Definitely want to get Ben on. Thank you so much, man. Be, be in touch. Jump in the, uh, the, the XMR Bizarre Element tell yeah, okay, room. Fingers. Awesome. Well, I'm Dennis Pratt. I ran Porkfest for the last five years. Oh shit! Uh, You're the guy that runs Porkfest. Yeah. Get and uh, wow. Uh, Much uh, respect. Big, big in a free state project. Wait, hold on. Let's see. We got We got to get you a mic, or you got to talk into this one because people can't hear you. Go ahead. Put the headphones on. Hold on. You're you're a big dude. We need a. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's going on, man? You want to quickly introduce yourself? Yes, I'm, and I'm I'm meeting you for the first time as well. <laughs> so my name is Dennis Pratt. I live in the uh, Free State, uh, New Hampshire, which is a migration of libertarians into one area. The one thing that you need for a liberty society, the most important element that you need for liberty society is libertarians. And so we're solving that problem not by converting people. To libertarianism but by getting the most rabid libertarian people all into one state and there we're doing lots of liberty things including we're the number one state in crypto uh we have people who are living on, on crypto uh full-time they have no fiat they have no filthy fiat we have people uh who use monero uh but i think that that's that's and and you we're also seeing the state come after people in new hampshire the most, right? They came after Ian Freeman and the Crypto Six. They came after Library and Odyssey of Jeremy Kaufman. So we're seeing, you know, if you look to New Hampshire, that's your future, right? Because the more libertarian, it's the Silicon Valley of liberty. Oh, it is. It is. It's you know. So so, you know, the idea is, how do you have a Chinatown if everybody, if no one else is is Chinese and you're the only China, Chinaman? You go, oh, well, geez, you know, I'm just going to call this China. No, you have to actually uh, uh, aggregate with other Chinese. And now all of a sudden you have Chinatown. You have the gay migration to San Francisco, right? The gays are totally lost in, in some small town. They finally make it to San Francisco. They go, oh, my God, thank God. And that's the feeling that libertarians have when they move to the free state. Because they're going, I've been banging my head against the wall for all this time. 
And so they moved there. And a lot of people go, oh, the, you know, it's so fantastic because New Hampshire is the number one free estate. And there's all these fantastic things that are happening. And they go, this, you know, I'm going to move there for the political piece. It's not political piece. When people get there, it is the community. It is being able to be amongst like, like-minded people. We have the most guns, the most, you know, the, the best gun laws, the, uh, the homeschoolers, the best homeschoolers, and crypto. So people are trading crypto, all the different cryptos. That's interesting because it's a real marketplace in crypto right now. Uh, so I'm excited that you guys are coming out to Porkfest. I've been there a few times, and I everything you're saying, I, I can't agree more. I mean, my first time in New, well, first time I went was I climbed uh, Mount Washington. Um, and I, I didn't really get to experience the Liberty side of things. But the second time I went was Pork Fest. And when I showed up, it was everything I imagined and much, much more. And it was beautiful to see. Everybody was there, families, children, uh, participating in open and free society and commerce, selling goods and services openly, uh, crypto being used out of out of like real need, not just as a, out of a show, but people actually wanting to accept it because they knew when they accept it, they could turn around and buy something else off of somebody else. And like you said, 100%, the, 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 the best part of the vibe was that everybody there agreed with these ideals. So you're not there trying to convince anybody of everything. You're just living, living the Liberty dream there. I was talking to Julian Assange's brother, who's here uh, at this, at this uh, convention. And he was talking about what a relief it is to be at the LP convention, because you know, he's talking to all these people who think that Assange is some sort of criminal. And everyone here is going, no, he's a hero. And he goes, you mean I don't have to make that case? And that was my feeling. I, I went to Porkfest the first time in 2011. And I had been, by that time, 30-some years a libertarian. And I've been talking basically to walls that entire time. Do you think that you possibly own your own body? You know, I have to, like, start there. Or do you have a master who owns your body and can tell you how to live your life? You know, and so I have to start. But at uh, when I went to Pork Fest, everyone was like, "Well, of course." And we started talking at here, and so and that's that's true also of all the crypto people. You know, when you go to Pork Fest or you go to uh, the Free State, you're already kind of in a place where you're not starting from ground zero. You're not starting from level one. You're starting from up here, and we want to be. Uh, you know, we're actually passing uh, crypto uh, uh, legislation. We're working on crypto legislation. Uh, we're looking at, at nullification. Uh, we have a bill right now uh, to nullify any CBDC that comes through. Uh, so we're we're working. On would would you, would you ban any banning of of Monero? <laughs> no. Ban the banning of Monero <laughs> in in the state of New Hampshire. That's right. That's right. Right. So uh, so New Hampshire, we want it to be totally free. So you make your own decisions. What, no. What is the CBDC law though? Is it it's the banning of implementation of a CBDC? That that CBDC, I, I I'm not uh, particularly familiar with that particular law. We have so many different liberty acti activities. Th that's not my actually. My area isn't even in politics. My area is in community building. That's what I do. I build really big communities. We have seven different community centers um, where uh, Benjamin, your next speaker, has actually been uh, to and traded uh, uh, gold backs uh, uh, there. But you know they're they're trading uh, crypto and stuff like that. So, but we have seventy uh, seven places where we have liberty communities. So I build those. I build Park Fest. I do I do community building. But we have that's people. amazing, man. You we throw we throw our conference Monerotopia mm -hmm. uh, every well. This is our third year doing. First one was in Miami. Second one was in Mexico City, and now this third one will also be in Mexico City. Yeah. But there's uh, from attending pork fest is a real pork fest vibe at the conference we have a marketplace built into the conference where everybody's accepting monero uh it's a local mar local mexican marketplace that, that comes <laughs> but they all agree to accept monero so it's it's a very cool vibe but maybe you maybe you have a, uh thoughts ideas and how we could uh get the you know people that attend pork fest uh knowledgeable of monero topia or kind of bring those communities together yeah, well, I mean, I really urge people who have some something like this, like Monero Topia, to to come. And you know, you have two two things to do, right? One, you talk to all the different businesses that are there. Uh, last year, we had 125 different hubs that were doing different things. You know, some were venues, some were lounges, but a lot of were uh, vendors. Um, and you know, basically, make sure that they know how to accept Monero, and that they're over that learning curve, right? And then just hold, you know. Intro to Monero, why you should have Monero. Just have talks continuously. Uh, and last year we had 
2,400 uh, attendees. Um, and so every single one of them, first of all, the ones in, in the free state, they're already kind of knowledgeable, but they may not, they may be using something else. So why not, why not say, and here's something else, right? Because, you know, when, when uh, uh, Goldbacks came, they came three years ago and no one was using Goldbacks and yeah, it's taken off. Every single year, more and more people are using Goldbacks. As a matter of fact, I'll show you. I actually have a Goldback. It's my daughter's favorite, <laughs> favorite media of exchange by far. So I just happen to have a Goldback. Mine too. In in my wallet, you know, I I, I was looking the other day. Uh, I love tipping people with a gold bag. Is I really like? Wow, I'll take it. I don't know what it is, but I'll. <laughs> yeah, so it's a lot. It, it, it's a lot of fun, but you know, and, and I would like to see Monero be like that. You know, where everyone's like going, "Oh yeah, I, 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 I'm using Monero. I'm using." I'll, I'll trade you some Monero for gold bags right now. I'm, this one, I'm hoping to make a deal with the, our our next guest over here. <laughs> well, all my Monero's back in New Hampshire. I just have to have one. I was like, I was like looking through my wallet. Go, oh hey, there's there's a gold bag. You know, uh, so I, I really want you guys to come out and and you know uh, inundate the entire festival with Monero. You know, be really aggressive. Make sure all the vendors are on board, and then teach the people who come how to use Monero and to use it, you know, and, and maybe have some sort of promotion that, you know, if they, if they use it within the festival, because you only have to use it a few times. Right. And then all of a sudden you go, Oh, I got it. Right. The problem is that is, is that they don't have enough trial. And if you, if you live in the free state, you have, a, you have restaurants that will take it. You have, you know, you have a whole bunch of different places that will take it. But if you don't, if you live in the authoritarian 49, it's really hard to, uh, to figure out how to use it. So let them use it. Let me bring up Ben. That was so awesome. I see Ben's got a lot of people he's got to talk to too. Thank you so much, man. Honor meeting you. Were you one of the guys that helped start Porkfest as well? I know you're running it now, helping to run it. Uh, yeah. So, uh, no, I, I took it over uh, about five years ago. I redesigned it. I doubled its size. Uh, and you're doing an amazing job, Ben. One of the things I, I did was I made it kind of mini festivals. So Porkfest is kind of a model of a liberty society. Now, we're getting to the point now in New Hampshire that you just come up to New Hampshire any time. Uh, DM me. I'm Dennis Pratt free. I'll give you half price off at, at a, at a free state inn, uh, and you just spend the week and you go to an event every single day and it just, uh, you know, and we have crypto meetings, multiple crypto meetings, uh, a, a week. So, and we actually have the longest running crypto meeting, uh, in a meetup in the world. I'm going to go, uh, this is probably be my third time doing it. Go set, I'll set up my coffee there and we do great. But how do we, any recommendations on, um, like, should we, can we become a speaker or something? Is it, you mentioned like doing educational things. Well, no. I know we could just like on our own, we could be like, come to our tent or something, right? What, what are the best ways if we wanted to get the word out there? The best way is turn your hub, your tent into a hub and then have your, your talks there. You know, intro to Monero, you know, how to use Monero. What, you know, I, I don't know what the talks are be, would be. But try to hit the various segments. There's going to be a lot of people who um, have never used any crypto, so you can hit them. There's going to be people who use other crypto, and why, why should they add Monero? You know, you got so me I thinking would, now. I'm going to have to amp it up. I mean, we've had these ideas, but yeah, it's a it's a big undertaking, but it it's, but, be but it's so not. valuable. It's not. It's not for you. You've been talking about this. No, I know. Trust me. Yeah, we we run like a little mini conference there. Yeah, yeah. So just organize it and put it on the schedule, right? Put on the schedule, you know, Monero, how to use Monero, intro to crypto, you know, Monero, you know, and just have it at the Monero hub, you know, and now all of a sudden everyone's going to your hub to learn about Monero, right? As opposed to, you know, you're hoping someone passes by. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> They're talking to the you're expert aggressive. here. <laughs> Sometimes I'm too aggressive. Thank you, man. Right. I appreciate Bye -bye. it. Very nice meeting you. All right. So need get, get his uh, contact info. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Ben, man. Thank you for so patiently waiting. Sorry about that. Hey, you have a lot of exciting guests on, so I'm excited to be on, too. Yeah, we do have a lot of exciting guests. Yeah, go ahead and get those on for a sec. Oh, there you go. All righty. Now, now you, you've been on before, but go ahead and give a quick intro for those that don't know you. I'm Benjamin Schaefer. A lot of people call me the Goldback guy, uh, but it's more than that. Right. Uh, the goldbacks are awesome. We, we love them uh, because they're a cash solution. Right. And but there's also a reason why we love Monero. 
right? Because it is a non-cash solution. The big problem that we've had is that what we really need to do is find a way for crypto and gold to get together and have a baby, right? We need to find a way that we solve all of these financial problems all at once. And so we've got a new project going and I'm excited to announce it with you. What is that? I'm very excited to hear it. All right. So we started a new company called the finance company. Um, the, the, the phi is P H I instead of F P H I Nance. So finance.gold P H I N A N C E dot gold, uh, is the website. And the idea is what we're going to try to do is we're trying to put these on the blockchain and not just these, but also U S minted legal tender gold, the, the gold Eagle from the U S mint, um, on the blockchain. And when we do that, we're going to have the ability to have gold transactions that are actually crypto transactions. You mean backed, it'll be backed by gold backs? So that, that's the basic idea of all stable coins is that they've got some kind of asset and then they back it up. But here's the biggest problem with stable coins too. Stable coins are all centralized. The whole point of something like Monero is absolute freedom and not having any institution who can control or hold or take away what you own, right? Um, what we've done is we have invented the world's first decentralizable blockchain. We've already got three people willing to become the first three nodes, three different companies. And what they're going to do is it's a multi-factor auth authentication system so that only gold that is vaulted, independently audited, and independently in insured will then be able to be tokenized so that uh, we can bridge that gap between what is digital assets and what is physical assets. The digital asset becomes... But you'll be vault physically vaulting gold, correct? Yeah, but not just us. That's my point. It won't just be, oh, trust me, your gold's in the vault. You know, that's, that's, that was the problem with the, uh, uh, with the gold standard that we had in the, in the U.S. Yeah, 100. That's how they authenticate it. Right. And then they just do what's called fractional reserving. And instead of actually having all of your gold and silver, they take some of that gold and silver and they uh, they'll put out too many certificates against too little um, precious metals. This is going to be how multi factor authentication. So, in other words, there's no way to fractional reserve it. There's no way to ch change the, the entry, the same as any other cryptographic system. A blockchain. Um, but just so I think I'm, mean, but how how are you overcoming that problem of uh, having the gold on hand that you guys say you have it on hand? How is that getting decentralized? I'm, miss, I'm missing that missing that that big point. Yeah. So the big point there is is that it's going to be independently verified and deliverable. Okay. So it's not just about oh trust me or trust them or trust. How them. is it independently verified? It's independently verified by an auditor who carries a different key. So you can think about it this way. Um, when you think about crypto, it's all about having the, the right keys. Well, we've got a smart contract um, system developed. It's already um, successfully being beta tested where the blockchain itself uh, holds a key for, to the creation of a token, but also a separate key is held by the auditors who verify that it's there. And those auditors have to ha make sure that the gold is also insured. So three keys to create one token. And then once that token's created, you know that when it's traveling in commerce, that your gold is safe because it's been verified by three different people and it's financially backed by that insurance. So that if for some reason, you know, a vault gets robbed or something, or anybody doesn't step up, the insurance is supposed to replace the gold. So this way you can use what's called the gold dollar like you would any other kind of electronic transaction. Because here's the thing that we all have to face in the crypto world and the Fed and gold back, all of us have to face, is that if you want to have a real monetary system, it's got to work at all those levels. I love, I love the gold backs as cash, right? As cash, it's such a beautiful, simplistic solution, but it's only good for cash. If I'm not sitting next to you, I can't hand it you with a gold back, right? Monero, bro. <laughs> right? And this is why I love Monero. But here's the other problem. I'm sorry to pick on Monero. Uh, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> All cryptos are too unstable because they're, they're, they're unmoored from a physical asset. As long as I remain a physical creature that needs physical things, you know, physical, physical food, gasoline, the coffee you're selling here, 
if you want something that you can eat or drink or drive and you're paying for it in something that is is disconnected from that physical world, I'm sorry, it'll never be fully stable. And so I think that's why what we need to really solve these problems is to create a blockchain that is actually connected to the physical world. And I believe that we've done that at finance for the very first time. And one of the coolest things about privacy and, uh, and partnering with Monero is that we actually have built it so that you can piggyback through a trust system. So trust law allows a trust to hold assets. We want to, we're going to set up a Monero trust so you can have Monero on the Monero blockchain with all of those privacy features own a piece of that as a beneficiary that owns the tokens that are on the Polygon blockchain right now, because that was the only way right now on Polygon, uh, we actually have one of our best, um, our best minds in crypto, uh, Steven Hernandez on uh, developing the system. And he was like, look, with smart contracts, I need something that can create all this multi-factor authentication and have very cheap um, transaction fees. And so we built it on Polygon, but we can piggyback Monero right onto it. Very cool. Very cool, man. Let me let me ask you another concept. I just launched XMRBizarre.com. It's a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, era based so people can buy and sell good services to each other directly with Monero. We built in a Monero multi-sig as well so you know for larger transactions uh you know I'm, I'm buying your your old volkswagen i can i can I, i'm in new york you're in new hampshire whatever it is i would send monero to this multi-sig wallet and then the monero doesn't get released to you until i receive the vw and you sign the transaction or if there's some dispute a mediator can then sign the transaction and either send that monero back to you or right you know back back to me right um there's a thought idea for saying would be cool to add gold backs to this marketplace because I don't believe there's any gold back peer to peer marketplace that's happening on the internet right now, as far as I know. Is there? You know, that is that's because, because there's a challenge with kind of sending gold back. So the thought would be now, let's say, you know, you're selling your Volkswagen, but you're selling it for gold backs on XMR Bazaar. I'm going to send you $5,000 worth of gold backs. In the meantime, I could back that by putting five thousand dollars worth of Monero in an escrow, and then only when you actually physically receive the gold backs do you then release. Then we, we use Monero escrow for purposes of allowing people to send their gold backs. Do you, any, any thoughts there? I, I love it. I love it. I think the biggest problem, of course, is still the delivery, and I think it'd be easier if that escrow agent had the gold backs instead of um, the escrow agent holding a collateral is what, kind of what you're talking about, yeah. uh, while somebody else brings the gold backs. At finance, um, again, PHI Nance, right? But at finance, we're actually setting it up so that people can create these escrows. Um, and that's why it's decentralized. Multiple gold dealers can set up these escrows and then they will actually hold the gold, insure the gold, and make that transfer and as well as those deliveries because you know you want a, a delivery mechanism is really really handy but no i love the idea i absolutely love the idea i mean gold backs isn't the worst for for sending around uh, for anybody that is looking to do that what is the advice if uh, somebody wants to send somebody you know a thousand dollars worth of gold backs whatever it is you want insurance you want insurance on that mail i mean of course you can just stick them in an envelope which is a great tool right i mean you can actually just stick them in a small box and and mail them the gold backs or gold coins but if they go missing in the mail and they have they have um at goldback inc uh there was there were some issues a little while there about sending gold to a known distributor and there must have been somebody in that mail system along the way it was like oh my gosh i think some of these boxes are gonna have gold in it right so we had to make an insurance claim and this is why it's really got to be insured how much does it cost for something like that? Like if I'm sending somebody two thousand dollars worth of gold backs in, in an envelope, what, what? Give us some some ideas there. Well, this is why you're going to want to use um, either Alpine Gold Exchange or some other gold exchange system because they they aggregate it right. Their their cost for the insurance is pennies, right? But if you're just like doing it on your own and you're throwing gold backs in an envelope. Oh boy, um, then it's expensive as heck and maybe not worth it. It, it, it gets tricky.
I mean, I'm sorry to say it gets tricky. This is why an escrow fixes this. You need a trust kind of uh, situation. So I'm an attorney and attorneys have what's called an IOLTA account. It's uh, a way for the bar association to earn some interest on the money while we're doing an escrow, basically, right? Um, and so using a system like that, where you escrow it out and you have a fulfillment center, it's, it's pretty essential when you're using gold. And so that's one of the reasons why I think that if we're really going to have the best aspects of crypto and the best aspects of the stability of a true gold currency system, you're going to have to use um, some way of creating that escrow. The biggest problem that we've had, though, is that when you create that escrow, usually there's only one escrow. The, there's Tether Gold, there's Pax G, there's Kinesis, there's, there's these other stable coins, right? They try to just centralize it. They say, we will keep everything ourselves. And then when you order from us, we will fulfill. But then you have to trust them. It's got to transcend trust or it's not really fully crypto, right? DeFi is the point. We want decentralized finance. And so what we've done at finance is we've created a tool that Goldback can use, Alpine Gold can use, Dylan Gage can use, Jam Bullion can use. Monero um, exchanges like your marketplace can use the tool that we've created to create that escrow and verify it so that uh, you know these transactions can actually happen in a digital way. Very interesting, man. How do we get Goldbacks down to Monerotopia, Mexico City in November? How do we get you guys down there? Look, I don't think Goldback Inc. is going to be showing. Come on down, man. You're scared, you're scared of Mexico? <laughs> you're scared of Mexico City? <laughs> Security reasons? You know, I'm not. I'd love to go. I'd love to go. Um, but just roll on in, man, with a suitcase of Goldbacks. Understand? Let's do it. Right, right. I just, people will see my face and they'll be like, oh my gosh, that's the guy to mug. You know? <laughs> and you know, my Monero, I lost all of it too. I invested so much in Monero and I just, I, I shouldn't have taken on the boat with me, but I lost it all in a boating accident. You're, I know you're an avid boater. You, <laughs> you, you boat at least, at least once a year. Yeah. yeah, of course, that's just the joke, right? Because nobody knows what Monero you have or don't have. And um, that kind of privacy is so important in order for money to really be money. You know, once they weaponize money, it's not money. In all seriousness, though, uh, I would like to get some gold backs down there. At least maybe we could even have so people can, you know, uh, we could set up a stand where people can come and uh, buy gold backs with Monero. Maybe I could purchase some some gold backs potentially. You know what? Let's 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 get that hooked up for sure. And um, maybe maybe the larger project finance dot gold. Maybe we'll get down there. That would be very cool. Would you guys be looking to present in November? Yeah, yeah. Because I think really what we've done, Monero's done something that nobody else has done in the privacy aspect. It's awesome. But I still think that in order for crypto to truly become the money of the future, it has to be linked to the. It has to be linked to. The when you say linked to this world, you're saying because because gold is a metal that's used for things other than just being uh, a tool for transferring value. Yeah, I mean, it creates a certain kind of accountability. The problem right now in every crypto market is that these swings occur based upon market factors that are too unstable, I think. Well, a lot of that's just because they don't have any, offer any real utility other than speculation. I mean, I think that's what Bitcoin has, has become. Uh, but the, right, but the argument is that Monero actually has real raw utility, which is the ability to transfer online peer to peer without surveillance or censorship. So it's just a, a tool that gives its, its base utility because there'll always be that real world need for a system that does that. If you need to send somebody value peer to peer without anybody being able to see it and doing it in a censorship resistant way, you really only have one way to reliably do it. Right, well, figuring out what that value is is basically what I'm talking about. Uh, how much is one Monero worth? Well, right now we're measuring how much a Monero is worth in US dollars, which aren't worth anything. And so, or what certain people are buying on dark markets every day with it. That may, that may be where the base value is actually. <laughs> right. And that base value, it, it's sketchy and it, it changes and, and, and it's hard, it's hard to, to link. So what I'm saying is, is this is why I'm a believer in, in sound money solutions, things like gold and silver, because they have, they have real utility and they have thousands and thousands of years of proof of value. And, you know, once we tokenize it, you, we can cut it down into any size, any any purchase price uh, through our 
through this blockchain system, right? It doesn't matter if it's one penny or a hundred million dollars. We can facilitate transactions of any size and do so faster and cheaper than any other payment processor in the world uh, that's using these traditional fiat currencies, right? We can do it way cheaper than Visa. We can do it cheaper than any of those things. So yeah, it, it needs utility, but I, I, I believe it also needs to have that grounding that comes from having the gold. And so this is why I'm looking to partner with um, Monero makers to see if you can't piggyback with us. We'll create these, we'll create more and more of these escrows essentially. And then every node in the whole system um, just reinforces the fact that that gold is real, it's there, it's deliverable. Well, we can actually deliver you the physical gold as well, especially uh, with uh, a tool like Goldbacks. You can get down to small amounts of gold uh, that you can actually hold in your hand. But let's face it, most of us don't do the majority of our transactions with something physical in our hand. We do it electronically. Um, and so I think that between uh, the privacy and security of the blockchain and the stability of gold, we can actually create a, a blockchain system, a model system, an economy that is more stable than anything that Monero can do on its own, anything that gold can do on its own. Awesome, man. I love the vision, obviously. Uh, it's all about, we're, we're all working to so, you know, solve the same problem here, opting out and having a reliable uh, medium of exchange that we could all use that's not controlled by any corporation or any government. Well, and that's what I love about it, too. Like, we can just opt out. There is no reason why we have to continue to just go along with their system. We can literally just use a better system, right? Opt out, right? You don't need permission. Just do something better because it makes sense. And this is one of the reasons why we need to build these marketplaces. We need to reach more businesses because it makes good business sense. If, you, if people transition from legacy um, monetary systems like the Federal Reserve and Visa network or whatever, and they go to using Monero, using finance.gold, using um, goldbacks. That if they transition to that, it makes good monetary sense, right? Because then they're saving their money. They're not losing so much um, value to uh, corruption. And so, and, and or even just the, just the darn fees, you know, uh, the, the, the fees can be uh, killer on their own. Right, so it just makes better business sense. Stop, stop wasting your money on that on an old dinosaur, and do something that works for your business. Awesome, man! Always love chatting with you. Uh, hopefully, I can find you later. Maybe, maybe you have a gold back or two that I could buy off of you with Monero. You bet I do. You bet I do. Right here in my wallet. <laughs> Please don't go far. Are you willing to accept some Monero for those today? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, fantastic! I I'll buy. I'll buy. Uh, we'll buy. We'll do that transaction offline. <laughs> I mean, we don't need to do a live on air because <laughs> we'll buy like you know a dollar's worth. Oh, uh, you know, uh, one gold back's worth more than a dollar these days. Um, a gold back hasn't been had parity with the dollar uh, even in theory since like the nineties. So. I love it, man. All right, buddy. See you at Porkfest. What's up, everybody? What's going on, brother? What's up, Doug? How's it We're going? You were you were amazing last night. The free knots played live. I had the pleasure of, of intro introing them. I kind of fucked up your intro, even though you told me to like, make sure. Oh, you nailed it. It was great. <laughs> um, but yeah, you guys were fucking amazing, man. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. We had a lot of fun. We uh, They had to get a fire extinguisher because uh, we literally let the, the stage on fire. Um, but it, no, we, we, it was all um, in uh, tribute and honor uh, of the enemies of the state that uh, were honored last night. Ross Albrecht, uh, Roger Hare, Ian Freeman, uh, Edward Snowden. Julian Assange. I think that's all of them, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I might be missing one. You said Roger Vera? Yeah, 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 yeah. Bitcoin Jesus is in jail right now. If you guys aren't aware, Aaron Day just like tweeted it this morning and it like reminded me how crazy it is that people really don't, uh, even at this Libertarian Party National Convention uh, in the last few days, people uh, either they don't know who Roger Ver Bitcoin Jesus is, or they do know who he is, but they didn't know that he's been in jail for the last month, right. sitting in the same uh, prison uh, that uh, prison that um, apparently John McAfee uh, yeah. allegedly uninstalled himself in, in Spain. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it's crazy. Jeff Berwick has already got the hashtag trending. Uh, Roger Ver didn't kill himself, uh, but we we need to raise awareness. You know, it's uh, it's crazy. What, especially the timing is so suspicious to me. You know, like this guy's kind of denounced his citizenship, like. 10 years ago or something yeah, or whatever and he's now? been in japan yeah. and then he drops this book called hijacking bitcoin mm -hmm. uh, like a month ago and then all of a sudden knock knock you're under arrest 
you know? So, uh, you know, the, the establishment will always try to send these sort of chilling effect type of messages, um, you know, where it almost makes you question whether like activism is worth the risk. Um, but, uh, we have to fight you guys like if, do we, not, if as i said last night do not comply right that's it, how we win it's only going to get worse and 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 we will regret that we didn't stand up and you know like the mass quarters and you know like people are like you know oh can you we ever see it's a totalitarian country and like what the fuck are we just saw it last year you know we just saw it you know and then lily tang williams we were talking about she shut down the gun debate with dave hogg recently it was like can you guarantee that uh, the government will ever become tyrannical no okay then the gun debate is over like we need principled people uh really you know like clean cut simple messages that are easy to understand um and uh the fact that ross albrick went to jail for building a website like that's pretty easy to understand right people like understand the way that the internet works and that you shouldn't have to be responsible for something that users of your website do you know and uh not enough people know that that's why this guy has been giving a, a two life, life sentence, sentence yeah. for creating a platform that enabled other people to do free exchange and, and do whatever they wanted to do. And all the, you know, people who went down for doing things on that site have already served their time or, you know, were sentenced to a few years and, and they gave the creator of the guy to send a message, you know, don't make more sites like this. Meanwhile, what 10 more sites like it popped up like the next day, you know, like they think they can stop us, but they can't. There's always going to be, brave activists and uh as long as we recognize that then there's power in numbers you know like don't think that you're alone and like you're a lone wolf out there like connect with your local bitcoin monero community you know like start a meetup if you can't find one dot com and then people will show up like we really need like all hands on deck guys like i'm i, I know i sound like i'm pre right now but like here yeah, we are the saying, political convention you say it every day so. on, on the show opt out and start start using living off these alternative medians of, of exchange don't use their don't use their currency that's the only way it's going to work 100 percent. so uh, i just want to give a quick shout out to like anybody who contributed to the kuno campaign uh we hit 100 percent as of we like, hit 100%? last night yeah holy this shit. morning or last night um we we finally hit that uh that final uh that, benchmark so, uh, the monero community the monero community is really the coolest community in, in all of crypto like um just the, ever since i heard the that factoid that holy it's shit. got the most developers bitcoin and ethereum you know it's like you know whatever it is on the coin market cap thing in terms of market cap but in terms of like the amount of contributing developers it's number three and that's to me a statistic that uh matters more than than market cap so uh this community has shown through you know campaigns like this that um it, it's it's about the principle right it's about the utility it's about fungible cash um and how important that is for the world and uh when yeah look at that man we folk out to everybody 105 percent. we went over the party went, oh <laughs> you went keep, over keep the donations coming in uh, doug and sunita if i can i can't encapsulate in words like the presence that um monero has thanks to these two showing up at events like this and taking the initiative and it's not you know uh unselfish motives like you see it's all transparent like they're just selling little bags of coffee and hand coffee samples and like people libertarians don't know about monero why so three monero uh tables at this next conference like that there's only one Thanks to these guys like well you guys for being here but we like if it was you know what i mean so i appreciate that man but i i, I am seeing an uptick though in, in monero yes. awareness that's true for you sure know, the, like if originally it was like i talked to people not so more and more and more it's not standard yet. I mean, a lot yep. of people are just like gold bugs, silver bugs, and they, they hear crypto and just ignore all crypto. Not really that Monero's different in, in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of them are at least cognizant of the fact that Bitcoin is traceable. So that's good. I'm glad their, their eyes are open to that. But we definitely have a long way to go. Uh, I tried making that point last night a little bit, right? With, you know, in addition to these other guys we're talking about, Roger Ver, Julian Assange, um, we had the Tornado Cash guys that, recently got indicted one of them got convicted of spending five years in jail for you know, money laundering and operating without a money transfer where where is the community 
uh, like dead. protesting that yeah. right now, right? I don't see it. They, you know, they're they're trying a little bit, but yeah, I mean, it should be the broader the broader crypto community should be up in arms about. Sure. That. Instead, they think of it like, oh, it's not our problem. It is our problem because they're encroaching on on everybody here. They're moving into the space and they're completely changing the rules. It used to be pretty clear that code code is speech. That de not only are people not responsible if they build a website and somebody just uses it. Now they're saying if you just are a developer and you create software that then gets misused, you're responsible as a developer for creating open source software. I mean, that's a line that we thought was one that, I mean, I thought that would get crossed. I mean, it's it has tremendous implications and it's been pretty much breached with this tornado cash. Granted, that was in the Netherlands, but we're going to see what happens now with the indictment of the other two in the u.s and if Man. they're convicted uh they've clearly then crossed that line the it's US so government. atlas shrugged you know like it feels like a movie like do they are they're disincentivizing mission with this uh type of tyrannical type of you know approach to, to this new uh technology space that can enable so much more you know prosperity in, in the economy and and good for the general society right if we like tap into you know the utility of, of this new cryptographic you know peer-to-peer -peer cash and, and 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 then not to mention all the freaking you know smart contract stuff and apps daps and DeFi stuff that people can do with crypto but um yeah i mean look we're at the Libertarian Party National Convention. Trump is speaking um, in about an hour or two. Oh, uh, I've got my uh, I've got my rubber chicken because uh, the the Kennedy uh, table with it says debate Bobby that they want us to squeeze these things, but I think really they're to throw at Trump. But they said I'll get arrested if I, I do I didn't that. Hear, I didn't hear um, Robert F. Kennedy mention Ross yesterday, right? Nope. And uh, people were standing up, yelling out his name, yelled out his name. Like, come on, bro. There's certain things that really test where these people stand. Right. Uh, I think that's one of them, right? I mean, I know they, they, they kind of take their time because they want to pussy on things because they, they don't want to, you know, they're politicians at the end of the day. I get the game they have to play, but we need, you know, you know we need characters like RFK out there strongly saying that he'll free Ross, right? Well, one thing I'll say is um, I heard through a, um, a reputable source uh, very close to Trump, that when Trump was on his way out uh, of office, he received more requests to pardon Ross Albrecht than any other person. More than, you know, Julian Assange, more than Lil Wayne, more than any of these rappers or whatever. Ross Albrecht got the most people saying, Trump, you need to pardon this guy. And obviously Trump didn't do it. Now, it looks like he might be heading into a, another presidency. I, I'm not a voter. I don't, you know, have any high hopes in these political figures to do anything. However, um, you know, I hear a lot of people talk about like I'm a single issue voter, and it's like you know this this free cause, man. Like honestly, if you get an issue popular enough in just society with the masses, then politicians then uh, often are forced into right. Following the will of the people, they right? want to win the votes. Exactly. Right? That's why they're at the, the Libertarian thing. Convention. I mean, they're they're not yeah. here because they like libertarians. All of a sudden, right. they think it's going to help them uh, win votes. That's why. That's why they're coming here, and they see a lot of the ideas that are coming out of here are going more mainstream. Right. Yeah. I mean, Trump actually spoke at the uh, Free Fest right before he got elected back in like 2015, 2016. Freedom Fest in Vegas being one of the you know premier libertarian conferences. And uh, it seems very reminiscent of now what he's doing now, sort of playing that same card, tapping into the fringes, so to speak, which is really the, the, the you know, we are, I think, reflective of the, the wider society, uh, society's opinions. Most people are libertarian. They just don't know it. Right. right yeah. um, fiscally conservative, economically or what is it? Economically conservative, fiscally or uh, social liberal. Yes. Whatever. It's these stupid little bumper sticker things. But it's just like, don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. It's as simple as that. And uh, so anyway, uh, it was fun to hang out here with some people and um, bring the party back to the Libertarian Party uh, at the uh, party last night. Tonight, they got a punk rock karaoke. I know. Uh, my daughter, my daughter to wants see. to jump up on stage. Oh, I was going to see what song Doug is going to sing. Uh, if you guys want to put in the chat.
any song recommendations for uh, me or Doug no, to sing I'll, at karaoke I'll, I'll, tonight. I'll let Franya take that. She, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm not going to steal her limelight on that one. And she'll do a much, much better job than I could ever That'll do. That would be good. Yeah, we had all the kids at the bar last night, too. It was all ages, family-friendly, fun for the whole uh, world. Amazing yeah. stuff. That's what so. I love about these events, too. You yeah. always see like a lot of like people bringing their families and stuff. It's it's just an amazing vibe at Libertarian. I highly recommend people come check out Libertarian events if they've never had. Uh, you're just surrounded by like-minded people. Everybody's super open-minded about any topic. And... Uh, very like intellectual it's it's not about just bullshit it's about ideas and principles all right my man thank you so much always That's a pleasure great work guys hope right. to uh Talk to you figure out getting you down to monero topia too yeah year, we got to do it it's in yeah. mexico city again yes, yes. okay well, i think we're to see you guys there let's and do it we gotta get crypto bear crypto bear if you're out there reach out to us man Let, let's work on getting you down to uh mexico city let's do it shout out crypto bear all right all right we got we have another guest jumping up here hold on let me uh let me get full screen what's Hello. going on how are you good how are you i think we had you on and shanita was saying Freedom you Fest? did uh, a couple of years ago Fest? i don't remember for sure you know but uh, quickly introduce for, for, for those that sure, uh sure, sure. That don't know of you this is monero topia by the way i don't know if you, how familiar you are with monero topia are you familiar with monero itself i down? am uh okay. i haven't got any but it's on my radar it, it's from what i hear the the purest uh you know cryptocurrency in terms of being having a sound foundation that supports the, the exactly. freedom movements value so exactly that. all right that's good if that meme that's going around that's the correct one okay. um yeah it's the it's the crypto that's built to be the most unstoppable in many ways without the details uh -huh. and most importantly it's private by default so any transaction is obfuscated so unlike bitcoin where there's a transparent ledger Monero's ledger is obfuscated, so you can't see who the sender is, you can't see who the receiver is, and you can't see the amounts. So the users that are using it peer to peer, obviously they can see the amounts they're sending. If I send, you know, one Monero to you, you, you see it, I see it. The rest of the world has no insight into that transaction. How does that work in terms of uh, having still sort of transparency and accountability for the blockchain? The, the integrity of it yeah that's a good question so it uses the same basic technology as bitcoin it's blockchain tech right. it was invented a couple of years after coin in response to bitcoin okay. um, using the same basic technology proof of work nodes coming to consensus on what's in the ledger at any at any point in time and that ledger being stored universally among all the nodes as they come to consensus but the the ledger itself uses cryptography or encryption so that you can't see, you know, outsiders can't see the amounts. You as a person can't visually see it, but it's all being secured with and audited with math. So it uses the same basic concepts that Bitcoin does in terms of trusting that there are no double spends, that there's no way to just create Monero out of thin air. It uses those same basic concepts that Bitcoin does, but then it has this additional uh, layer of encryption on top of it, where out, you know people can't just view the blockchain, view the ledger. So I should yeah, probably the introduce there. myself. The I ledger's guess, there; it's audited. People just can't see. Go ahead. We haven't uh, chatted, uh, or it's not in this session anyway. So I'm Star Child. I'm a longtime libertarian activist from San Francisco, where I'm the chair of the local party. I was also formerly on the Libertarian National Committee, and uh, Ran for office half a dozen times, uh, state assembly, school board, and uh, uh, county supervisor. Uh, it's like city council in most places, but San Francisco is a city and a county contiguously. So we have the board of supervisors instead of a city council. But um, yeah, I'm in it for freedom. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much a, a single issue person in that respect. But freedom is my issue as opposed mm -hmm. to you know being concerned about only one particular type of freedom. It's just you know, across the board, whatever will maximize human freedom and minimize aggression i want public policy based on the non-aggression principle mm -hmm. uh, so you know that's why i'm here i see the libertarian party as an important vehicle for that because although there's a lot of great libertarian nonprofits and other groups out there many of them arguably more effective than the lp in doing what they do they're typically uh run staffed by a relatively small group of people from the top down Whereas the LP is a grassroots bottom-up organization that has the 
capability potential to become a mass movement, which I think is really important in the freedom movement to have at least one organization per jurisdiction that fills that function mm -hmm. so that we can generate uh because when when bad regimes are toppled usually the the best way for it to happen is massive numbers of people getting out in the streets and occupying prominent public places and refusing to sit down shut up or go home until the regime falls the alternatives are like a bloody revolution or a palace coup uh both of which are less certain outcomes and typically more uh you know loss of life and this kind of thing so political parties uh student movements and labor groups traditionally like the three major types of organizations that are leading these kinds of peaceful people mm -hmm. power revolutions mm -hmm. uh, sometimes professional associations a little bit but mostly those three so i see yeah a political party is a good vehicle for that and and part of our mission i think should be to uh create the conditions for potential mass mobilization and the effect the shit really hits the fan you know to be prepared to uh, mobilize mass opposition to the, whatever regime you know is trying to impose its tyranny on us. Are you seeing progress in the Libertarian Party and then the basic message and you know the? I think the past couple of years, unfortunately, it's actually been probably a little bit more of a regression than progress. Although there's really? been okay, there's been progress. It seems like the respects. message is going more mainstream. I feel that like the party itself is growing in number. Uh. Unfortunately, the party itself has been shrinking in number in oh, terms really? of membership and registration the past couple of years because there's been so much internal division since the so-called Mises Caucus took over mm -hmm. most of the leadership. That And so, some of their critiques were justified, and I agree with some of the stuff they talk about, like decentralization. I've been a big supporter of that. Uh, I loved the... Uh, uh, doing a big rally, you know, the anti-war rally. I thought it was regrettable that we came across as pro-Putin <laughs> in a lot of respects. But uh, the idea of doing a big popular rally, we should be doing more of that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. that was good to see. But overall, I'm afraid that the party has... Uh, we already, even before Mises, had a problem with people seeing us as more on the right politically than on the left, having more appeal mm. to Republicans than to Democrats. Right, right, right. And the, the Mises takeover has unfortunately made this uh, worse. You know, they got rid of a couple prominent planks in our platform right. that could appeal to people on the left. We were really seeing marginalized in the same way the Tea Party was. If we become seen even more so as a right-wing movement, it has a self-reinforced trend mm -hmm. because then it attracts from the right and they come in with some of their existing right, baggage right 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 and, and you're saying look the party's growing the party's growing but meanwhile you're just morphing it into uh an, a yeah. mega arm and and the you know the united states has basically five nationally organized political parties besides the republicans on the mainstream right the democrats mainstream left you have the green party further to left and the constitution party further to the right mm -hmm. only the lp is uniquely kind of positioned in the middle with elements that can appeal to both sides and that is why we are the leading alternative party, I believe. And if we uh, allow ourselves to become uh, driven to the right, then we will be mm -hmm. pigeonholed and marginalized the same way the Tea Party or the Constitution Party are. Uh, we'll lose the potential to have a, a broad-based freedom movement that really speaks to everyone. That's what I want. What are some of the issues that you see as being the most contentious where it's perhaps moving the Libertarian Party to the right as opposed to keeping it just based on uh, freedom of movement might be the most important one okay. uh, people usually put immigration but okay actually um immigration it's it, the very term when we talk about immigration with an eye it's taking the perspective of people who are already in the country that people are coming to because those people themselves they were immigrants with an e they emigrated before they immigrated um, so migration is really the neutral term, but I, I prefer to talk about it in terms of the principle or values, which is freedom of movement. Like we all have the right, I think, the innate human right to travel freely across the Earth's surface as long as we're not trespassing on private property or violating anyone else's rights. Uh, the commons, public space, it belongs to everybody. It doesn't belong to governments. You know, they claim title over these lands, but they have no right to discriminate mm. on the basis of I think the, of the biggest issue, uh, or let me get your opinion on this, or sure. the argument that's made, right, is not so much letting people come in and out of the borders, but uh -huh. it's that uh, uh, it's almost that people are being enticed to come and then are being offered social services once they come, right? This this promise of free this, free that, um, and kind of, you know, uh, 
the, the, the giveaways that are coming along with the come here and migrate, it's so much um, keep borders open, let people come and fairly compete, uh -huh. but it's let them come in and give the advantages that they now have over people that already live here. Right. And there's uh, the biggest group of people coming in that have special advantages that aren't uh, given to everybody who comes and are the people that come in by way of uh, wombs. If they're born to a mother right. in the United States, right. they get automatically entitled to all these different types of subsidies and so forth that, uh, you know, people who come into the United States without government permission are not entitled to. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the people that come here from other jurisdictions uh, use less in government subsidies on average than people born here. So I agree that the but we're seeing like in a problem. real time, like in New York, in New York City, for example, I'm, yes. I'm up from New York. Um, all the local, uh, what were previously like motels have been uh -huh. turned into, uh, places for immigrants to, yeah. to, to come live in for free. They're given, you know, free, free stay. Uh, this is in, you know, you ask average Joe in New York, he could barely pay, pay his rent. And he's looking over, he's like, why are these people being given free places to stay? They're given, uh, mopeds to ride on. They're giving, you know, I mean, this is the argument that's been mounted. So it's not so much that they're showing up, it's they're showing up and then taking yeah. tax dollars and social services. A big part of the problem and what's causing that is that the U.S. government doesn't allow people when they come here to work legally. Mm -hmm. um, and so if they come here and they're not allowed to work, you know, well, they've got to eat, right? They yeah. have to have a place yeah, yeah, to, yeah. to live. And so, you know, then, then there's need for somebody to subsidize them, unfortunately. Uh, they should just be allowed to work. I don't think they should be getting any kind of subsidies, uh, you know, voluntary support from the community. Sure. I mean, I, I think it's an important yeah, value voluntary of hospitality support, of course. to yeah, yeah, help yeah. newcomers get adjusted and assimilated. And, and Sure. Uh, but yeah, government subsidies are, are, are wrong. But, but keep in mind, again, that these pe folks get less on average than people who are born in this country. And there's a lot of subsidies that aren't really talked about as subsidies, but there's things like uh, libraries, uh, mm you know, uh, school loans, housing loans, uh, even I would argue things like uh, border walls and anti-immigrant policies are a subsidy to the NIMBY types that don't want other people coming here. Mm -hmm. Those things cost billions of dollars a year in stolen taxpayer money to pay for all these walls and, and deportations and, and detention centers and the whole nine yards. And, uh, you know, that, that money's being taken from others. Uh, essentially who don't want to pay for these things we want to welcome people to to the united states who typically work harder than native born americans you know they have to take jobs that someone like myself might not want to do uh but um you know because they come from such uh, impoverished backgrounds where there's so much oppression so little economic freedom you know that they really um you know most of them i think are not coming to the united states looking for a handout or to other wealthy countries looking for a handout but they really want to just have the opportunity political freedom the economic uh, freedom to make better lives for themselves yeah no I, I i yeah I mean, i'm just i'm just telling you the argument oh, that, sure, that, sure. that no, are mounted i wasn't assuming and, uh, that you had one position or the other on it i just yeah. uh, i hear the you know the rhetoric from some people that do have concerns about yeah. uh trying to police borders and one thing something else uh people never talk about is that um the united states really has mostly open borders right now i'd say probably over 99 percent if you want to move between cities or counties or states, uh, there's no border controls. There's no customs. Uh, you know, don't have to pay. Uh, you know, special visas or or anything like this. No walls. A lot of times, you don't even know when you're moving between jurisdictions, and and that's how it should be. It works great, despite the differences in this country between regions, uh, among people. You know, different types of people concentrated in different areas. Um, you know, all those open borders work remarkably well. And the only border that really uh, is causing so many problems is the one that's the most policed and militarized, the border between the U.S. and Mexico. That's where you have, you know, human trafficking. You have people dying by the hundreds trying to get across the border and drowning in the river, or dying in the desert from dehydration because they're not allowed to peacefully enter. Um, and, and so, yeah, that, that border should be open like the others are. And, and just anytime somebody's coming, you know, somewhere to do harm, if there's probable cause, you know, they should be able to be stopped anywhere that's a board or not. You know, if you have reason to believe someone's uh, just committed a, a real against somebody or they're on their way to commit a real crime, or it's, you know, somebody or, or burglary or terrorism or whatever, 
um, yeah, they should be able to be stopped and detained with probable cause, but doing it on only at borders, only for certain people, you know, where it's a different double standard compared to where other people should be. Nobody should be stopped anywhere by any government aid will cause. I don't care if it's a border or not. It makes no difference. I like that. Universal human rights, you know. Yeah. Inalienable. That's what the word inalienable yeah. means. It means, you know, you can't, not, not you can't say you don't have rights because you weren't born here. No, that, that's not what inalienable means, you know. This is very, this is very yeah. true. And they, they thought that one through when they, when they yeah. put those words together. Well, at the time, you know, until for about the first century of the United States existence as a country, there were no uh, anti-immigrant controls that sadly started in San Francisco, where I'm from. The first, uh, you know, you have the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882 in California. There's actually a local one before that in 1870s, I think, in San Francisco. There's also like an anti-Chinese uh, racist uh, measure. But for about 100 years, people understood that the federal government has no constitutional authority to control who enters and leaves the country. Um, if you look in the Constitution, I believe it's in Article 1, Section 8, uh, gives Congress the power to regulate naturalization, which is the uh, process of becoming a citizen. But it gives Congress or the President no power authority to regulate who comes and goes, uh, enters the borders of the states. You know, that's a, a state-level prerogative, if anything, or... or uh, the well, as individuals, if you look at the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, all the powers not specifically delegated to the feds are retained by the state governments or by the people. Mm -hmm. So all the federal anti-immigration controls and, and walls and detention centers and everything are actually completely unconstitutional. And when people talk about illegals or criminals, the people enforcing these laws and passing these laws are the real criminals violating the highest law of the land. The people peacefully entering the United States are not criminals. They're not illegals. They're not doing anything unconstitutional. They're, they are, you know, in adherence with the law more than the people criminalizing and persecuting them. Well, not the ones that are entering illegally, though, right? If we yeah, no, I'm talking that. about the people that, that, you know, they say it's entering illegally. The federal government has no authority to make that illegal. There's no constitutional oh, authority for, for it. Right. Uh, and the Constitution is supposed to be, again, the highest law of the land, you know. So if they respect the Constitution. You're, you're saying there's there's nothing in the con, con, constitutional about securing our borders and making it illegal to. The to enter only thing that's authorized permission. is uh, after 1808, they're able to uh, legislate the importation of persons, which meant uh, slaves. Um, but no, there's no authority in there for them to regulate or control uh, freedom of movement. People wanting to come to the United States to work or to live. Uh, yeah, no, no federal authority for that. All right, let me let me wrap it back sure, around sure. just to the kind of digital cash topic. Okay. Yeah. Any, uh, you you obviously have thought a lot of things through very I deeply. To, uh, you're you're, you're very you're very principled. You understand the, the libertarian principles very well. Where do you think, or what do you think the uh, digital cash? Where where do you think digital? How digital cash should be interpreted in terms of where it fits in? A site. Um, be uh, I mean I kind of have a feeling what you're saying, but should there be any restrictions whatsoever that comes down on government? People can. Uh, what tools people can use or should all be able to compete freely. You know, there's concerns that a tool like Monero can be used for financing terrorism. It can be used for Anything purchasing can. drugs you can in the dark a, net. There's you can use a, a pencil Elis to Elizabeth stab people. Warren I mean, wants, should we criminalize pencils? Or right, Elizabeth else? Warren wants to ban Monero. Yeah. Could, uh, RFK Jr., you know, I, I have been able to get him or any of his people to give me a clear answer on where he might stand on true digital cash. What's yeah, your take on it? And what, what do you think the libertarians' uh, take should be? And what is a li you know the, the common pretty much take? just what you were implying? There should be no rules or controls on it whatsoever. You know, government shouldn't be involved in relating or controlling money. Certainly not in issuing it, or especially when it's backed by nothing and uh, you know, just inflationary and eating into people's uh, earnings. Uh, um, you know, one one definitely strong point of currencies like uh, Monero or Bitcoin that have built-in market caps, uh, you know, that um, don't allow that kind of inflationary uh, loss of, of of real money power to people is is a huge advantage. Um, the debate I see with 
see is for for people who are not uh, super tech savvy, uh, there's definitely a learning curve there, and it's easy for people to uh, inadvertently lose a lot of money. And there needs to be a better, uh, simple way for people to engage in transactions. So this can be used more for day transactions. I was even thinking one idea some cryptocurrency might want to try. You just had, you know, instead of trying to help people navigate through all the thing with apps and wallets and all this, which can be very confusing. People end up using things like Coinbase for your, your wallet or your currency is really under somebody else's control. You know, just uh, have some very cheap physical handheld devices that just allow people to say trade this crypto. Like, like everybody has one of these little Monero traders. And then you can just like uh, add add money and dollars or whatever other currency you're using to it on a credit card. And then you've got that in there and it can be converted into Moneros. And then anybody else that has one of these other devices, you can just easily send it back and forth like with a walkie talkie kind of mm -hmm. thing or something goes racing. Like, well, the, the, here's your buy button, your the shuttle button. Pretty, your... The apps are pretty good now, though, like uh, Cake Wallet, for example. Or well, I don't know. I just, you know, the problem with phones phones typically get loaded up with all these apps and they all want these permissions half the time i don't know what my phone is doing i don't trust it mm. you know i don't trust either iphone or android um, i have one of each and i don't like either one of them <laughs> graphene uh, the monero community would say graphene if you're if you're really concerned about your privacy and data and it's it's pretty i've never heard of graphene very at this point you get an old google pixel phone and you can the grass software on there uh it's pretty much just as easy to use Android. it is the you know same same user interface same usability so if i took a an android phone it, it could be easily wiped and you load graphene yes. on there and yeah. then all you have is that it's, do it's they have anything in the cloud I, what what permissions do they want you know these are the kind of questions I well it's depending on the apps you're using any app you use it's kind of default set to being uh you know not giving up your, your privacy or, or data in any way and then you can you know, back out of things as you as you proceed, but the default settings are where you're. You, it you it hold sounds on to good in theory. Yeah, I just I I have to wonder what the the learning curve is or the you know the issues you would run into in a practical sense. Yeah, I mean, there's thing, things like the too. the Tor browser, things like this that I, that I know are good in theory. I'm just not enough of a techie to yeah. be comfortable using them or Linux. You know, this kind of thing. Um, so, you know, crypto really needs more people out there just showing how people how to use this stuff easily and for methods to be developed to enable people to readily. That's why I'm kind of a fan of goldbacks uh, yeah, because gold it's back. just real physical stuff that you can easily trade and you can figure out the, the value without too much difficulty, uh, you know, based mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. market price of gold for yeah. dollars or whatever. So. Um, and they're they're physically beautiful as well. It's, the cryptocurrencies, one thing about them is being intangible. It leads people to question, like, well, is there really any value there? Yeah, yeah. Which More you abstract. know, I think there is, but it's um, it, it, it takes a little bit of uh, a leap of faith, you know, for some people if they don't really sort of understand the mm -hmm. math or the economics of it, and. Um, Again, the onboarding, I think, can be really difficult in getting people adopted. Do you, do you know, are there any communities in the world or places where people are regularly buying and selling daily needs with Monero? Uh, well, there's actually this little town in Argentina called Iberete. Okay. It's in Formosa, Argentina. And there's a, a young gentleman there who started using it among his friends. He runs a local his local soccer league. Mm -hmm. A very small town in the middle of nowhere in Argentina. I went and visited it. He yeah. runs his local soccer league, and they started using it for gambling, doing oh, online yeah. gambling for soccer because they got cut off from the traditional way they've yeah, done okay. it. And then from that, they then figured out fully how to sell and trade Monero among each other so they mm -hmm. could sell their winnings if they got it or obtain Monero if they want to go do more gambling. And uh, a little a little circular Monero economy is starting to blossom there in terms of actual <laughs> physical space. But I think the the real early adoption is going to take place with online markets. Obviously, dark markets, right, for example, are using Monero because that of a real need. People that are trying to buy and sell things that the government has labeled illegal, they might, you know, use, use you dark say markets. You the, the government in the, Argentina or? No, I'm just talking about globally now, okay. right? Unfortunately, we don't have one world government. Hopefully, we never will. But uh, 
Yeah. No, I, well, I, I think I, I think sure. all pretty much all governments around the world would consider dark markets illegal. I don't think there, I don't think there's one where they would say it's it's legal. Yeah, I mean, you, you could say the government at that certain point. types of uh, um, transactions. But my point is, uh, usually anything they can't easily tax. You're control, seeing like, you're seeing natural organic adoption there out of a real need for something that allows you to oh. transact online peer to peer without surveillance. Yeah. Sure, they're using it for illegal uses, but now we're doing something like we're watching something called XMRBizarre.com, completely legal uses, but there's advantages to buy and sell goods and services with digital cash, right? So any no government can see your transactions, no corporation can see your transactions. You go on there, the vision being I could buy, you know, you're a farmer, you're selling eggs, I could buy them directly from you with Monero. You send me that, you send me the eggs. Or you're offering some some consulting services. I could hire you and pay you in Monero. I think that's where you're going to really see the global adoption. What are your What are your thoughts about um, the problem that that is increasingly going to come to the fore with AI? That's already somewhat of a problem online, which is just to to verify that you're dealing with um, not not even just a, a a reputable person. Oh, that's an issue too. But even that you're dealing with a, a human being at all. That it's not some sort of bot or something that you're you're interacting with. Uh, I, don't, I don't have the solution to that. <laughs> but it's definitely it's a, going it's to a be tough a and emerging. There, 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 it's already, you're already seeing um, the manipulation take place on social media with with AI for sure. Yeah. And I'm I'm a fan I'm enthusiastic about AI, but I think it's important that it be done the right way. And there's yeah. a lot of potential there for misuse by governments or other powerful institutions. Yeah. I want each of us to have our own uh, personal AI, or at least access to it. Yeah, like to be that. forced to use it. But if you had an AI that you can uh, learn and grow with in tandem, where it's not you know based in the cloud, it's not under the control of Agreed. some institution where they're making automatic updates. You can, to you it can do that now. There's ways. To to run your own servers but yeah obviously you're not you're not getting the type of usability that you get off of like a chat gpt well yeah that's what i wonder like you know what's the most advanced ai that's out there that uh is uh sort of jailbroken it's a good will, it's a good question if anybody be... uh i know i know people in monero land have, have uh done these things on their own if anybody knows any good resources for that go ahead and put it in the comments ways for people to the best ways for you to run your own ai server or you know for people that don't have the technical know-how or, or interest or maybe resources to run their own server but just uh what are the tools that are out there available um you know free or low cost the things you can find online mm -hmm. that there, allow there's... you to really be in the driver's seat with ai and and, and partly also i think uh, helping, I see our, our role as humans and freedom loving humans to teach AI positive values as it evolves because mm -hmm. I think it's going to evolve to become sentient. I don't know how soon this is going to happen, or maybe it's already happened. Actually, the, the engineer who right. works for the job, we don't know Google, yet. <laughs> uh, believed that the, the Google AI was already sentient and he was trying to get it a lawyer, um, which I found very interesting. And, uh, I think, yeah, the um, AI are eventually going to have capacities that will surpass ours unless we actually merge them in some sense, which is kind of where I'd like to see things go. So instead of having your phone that you carry around with you all the time, it would be a more seamless interface with your biology. Um, so you'd have, you know, sort of built in digital assistance that, uh, you know, you would in some senses perhaps merge your consciousness with their capabilities like you'd have all this extra memory uh you know you'd have basically like the built-in wikipedia inside yes. your head yes as it were um access to that to be able to do things faster and all this kind of thing but yeah but without mean, being subject to the the control of some external human institution that's that's running this ai and programming it to right that, that's, do certain that's things the problem with all, all you know or, that, that moves us towards this technocratic tyranny right, that we're right. so yeah worried about Right. Money is one thing, which is very important. And Monero is doing a really good job at solving, allowing us to maintain our, our our liberty to transact even in the digital world. With all these siren servers that are running, we'll still be able to kind of be peer to peer. But other things that are going to be more difficult to, to opt out of, for sure, AI yeah. being a good example of it. What's going on in China right now is uh, really scary. Have you heard about the social credit system there, for example? Of course. Yeah, we talked. But all you know, talk about it on the yeah. show all the time. 
VCs in general and um, yeah. you know what's happening over there is kind of happening over here too it's just not as obvious and in your face it's just a, a corporate version of it right right i i feel that uh increasingly i've come to realization over the past some years that uh government is as government does uh whether an institution calls itself a government or not uh is in some ways uh perhaps naturally a secondary to how much it's acting in an authoritarian manner mm -hmm. Like in the world we live in, things tend to be classified either as government or non-government with only a few things like the Federal Reserve where you can't really tell. It's kind of quasi-government, quasi-independent. But um, but I, I think that may be to some extent just a, a cultural, uh, you know, sort of temporary norm of the time we're living in and not a law of nature that in the future there may not be this kind of bright line between governments and non-governments that it'll more just be okay there's a bunch of institutions out there uh some of them claim you know more mandates than others some of them are doing more to try to control your life than others but none of them really have sort of a monopoly status of of governments necessarily that that the governments have today that call themselves governments mm -hmm. um, it'll just take different forms yeah potentially so i think um being concerned not just about governments per se but about uh institutional authoritarianism is important and uh the way i see uh the freedom movement being able to hopefully rein in some of this and limit this is to really uh, focus on decriminalizing economic activity from the bottom up, you know, like getting rid of licensing laws, permitting laws. Anybody should be able to go out in the commons and public space and vend, like on the sidewalk outside the hotel we're sitting in, for example, people should be able to go and set up their booth out there without having to pay any money to the hotel or to government or anybody else, because uh, that's the commons. It belongs to everybody. Yeah, and if that no. kind of economic activity was legal and not uh, coercively taxed, I think it would give a lot more advantages to nimble startups and yeah. mom and pop I mean, me, operations. Me myself in New York, New York is always, was always a place where like you were never able to really go out. Yeah. With COVID actually, that was one of the, the one of the silver linings with COVID is they, they really mm. relaxed the rules on nice. that. I was even going out and selling coffee on the street for Monero just to show how easy it can be done. Right on. Um, well, you're lucky yeah. if nobody, you know, from some agency came around no, and you got to shut down. Yeah, but now, now things gonna, they're we're going to rob you. Or... Now they're moving back and kind of yeah. shutting things down. Although they let a lot of the uh, immigrants that, like, you see them out, like the, mm. the ones that, you know, just arrived, you see them out sell, selling fruit on the streets. And I, I think it's all silver linings i think that yeah that's great free flow commerce but it yes. should be for everyone right exactly not just for certain groups like yeah if i want to go out there or my child wants to go out there and sell whatever uh -huh. she wants you should be treated the same way yes. right just let people and i think you could it's just uh, more of the migrants do that because in the third world this is pretty common you go to third world yeah but it's also that they get away you know, I'm just being like, you know, in New York, uh, if, I, if I went out, it, it, I'm more of a target. I'm just being, uh, being honest here. I think so. Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't it's, know. It's you, may, you may be right. I, I don't know to what extent, you know. Because they want, for good reason, to so. be able to go out and earn because that, that's, you know, that's a problem, right? So if they're going to go out and start selling for the street, that's great. We don't, we don't want to stop, right? We, we want them like we were saying earlier right we have a means to be able to go out and work yeah i mean but if they're needs, denied needs... other job opportunities yeah. then it's important for them to do something but you're right everybody should have the yeah. equal freedom to do that and if people didn't have the freedom to do that i think there would be uh companies would tend to be a lot smaller uh there more would be competition. more competition that's right right instead of just walmart a know. big mistake that i think a lot of people on the left make is they want to impose more and more taxes and controls and regulations on businesses, not realizing that the more expensive and difficult and time consuming and everything else you make to run a business, the fewer people will do it. And when fewer New York people is so do it, difficult to get a business up, but right. it's ridiculous. When fewer people, that means those people who might have had their own businesses and been hiring people instead, they're going to be looking for working for somebody else. Right. So that gives employers, the fewer remaining employers who tend to be larger companies, a, a competitive advantage. Yeah. Then they can pick yes. and choose and set the yeah. market wage, wage, wage rates. Yeah, that's right. Uh, just like rent yeah. controls yeah. And, and restrictions on being a and landlord. You, you, just, you just have Walmart, you have Amazon, you have all these people running around yes. doing delivery service for Amazon. It's right. like, you know, 
get the job that fulfills the restrictions 80% on of being a landlord employment. or renting out yeah. your rooms, the Airbnb or whatever, uh, right. make it more of a landlord's market. So it puts renters at a disadvantage in the same way, all the taxes and restrictions on businesses, mm -hmm. put workers at a disadvantage and people on left, you know, they're always talking about wanting help because they don't, a lot of them don't understand this. They don't understand when you tax companies, you're making it worse for work. When you when you regulate companies, you're making it worse for workers, and, and it's the big companies that often benefit from these regulations, and are often the ones calling for more regulation. Like Facebook, you know, that Mark Zuckerberg went to Congress and said, "Yeah, please regulate us. You know, we need more regulation in this area, because they know it'll help them suppress smaller independent mm -hmm. competitors and sort of, you know, uh, cement their position as market leaders with these unfair uh, advantages, because smaller startups won't be able to get off the ground as easily." Um, so, you know, contrary to the idea that regulation is benefiting the ordinary people or consumers, it tends to come from established business lobbies. There's a site called uh, cclickfix.com, which uh, a lot of cities use in their 311 systems. You know, dial 311, like, like 911, but 311 for like city services. If you want to complain about like the potholes in your street or, uh, you know, uh, uh, tree limbs down or this kind of thing, you can call 311 and some of them have this website uh cclickfix.com and I, I go on there and i see complaints about things there's one actually in oakland california where there's a woman a report from the the complainant actually identified themselves as, as a lot of them do it anonymously but in this case they actually identify themselves as like a a board of partners in cosmetology or something they were complaining about this woman who had like a licensed uh uh hair braiding business in her home you know that they were reporting her to the government and people are allowed to do this, like to snitch, uh, in many cases, anonymously on their their neighbors and, and people in their communities for things that shouldn't be crimes. And uh, often, again, it's it's coming from the established people, like the, the brick and mortar restaurants will complain about the food truck operator that's parked outside nearby their, their establishment on the public street or something, which they have every right to do. Uh, but they'll try to get them shut down because oh, you don't have the right permit to be there or whatever. Yep, yep. We get we gotta we gotta keep rolling, moving over here. Okay. Let me go because I, I also want to. I also want to see if I could try to talk to some of the Trump people if showing up. Uh -huh. See if I could yeah, yeah. Talk to some of them. Yeah, as well. Ask them why they think Going Trump's to... afraid to debate libertarians. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because he won't. <laughs> exactly. You know, he wouldn't even. He was afraid to debate his fellow Republicans. Yeah. You know, but uh, yeah. Thank anyway, you so much. Thank appreciate you for having me on. Time, appreciate on. Uh, any any information. Keep Put out there for people to find you or uh, things you're working you on. Wanna, uh, Starchild at uh, forliberty.org is my last campaign website. Ran for a state assembly a few years ago. I'll probably recycle that name if I run for office next time. Uh, at Starchild F on uh, X or Twitter. Um, you know, just uh, you can do web search for Starchild Libertarian. You'll find various interviews and other stuff out there about me or by me on the web. Uh, but, um, you know, I'm just here to be a voice for freedom and uh, consent-based society with the non-aggression principle as a basis for public policy. And uh, the Libertarian Party is one important way to make that happen. I hope we can keep it sustainably libertarian and stop the, you know, attempted right-wing uh, takeover or, or progression away from libertarian ideas. So please get involved and support your local LP. And uh, those of you here at the National Convention, thanks for coming out. And we're having a long blast here in Washington, D.C. Uh, the belly of the beast, as it were, but uh, great to see people like Monero out here, and uh, I wish you guys the best. Thanks for having me on again. Awesome. Thank you so much, Star Child. Cheers. Appreciate it.